So we have picked two representative supernova remnants for the type 1a, we've picked um, Tycho's supernova remnant. And for the type 2, we have picked uh, G292.0 plus 1.8. Um, so that students have a representative spectra of each type of supernova and the elements that would be found in each one. And then they can use those prototypes or the ones that we've picked to then investigate other supernova remnants and determine if they are a type 1a or a type 2. So you can see um, in the spectra that there are some def definite differences um, around the abundance of elements. A type 1a remnant will have strong silicon, sulfur, argon, calcium, and iron emission lines, and fairly weak oxygen, neon, and magnesium. And then the type two kind of has a reverse pattern. So the oxygen, neon, and magnesium, um, you can see have much stronger peaks on the type two than they did on the type 1A. Um, one issue is that sometimes um, due to interstellar absorption, the photons that are 1500 electron volts or less can sometimes be absorbed. Um, before they're actually recorded and they might be missing from the spectrum and you can kind of see that below 1500 electron volts on the graph that's on the right hand side if those were missing it would be kind of hard to identify that as a type 2 supernova so just because they aren't there doesn't mean that it's not a type 2 supernova remnant other things that students can look at is in a type 1a there will be no core remaining in the middle. The white dwarf is completely destroyed during that supernova. Um, but in a type two, you are gonna have a core remnant, which usually um, in JS9 will be like a fairly bright pixel towards the center of the supernova remnant. Um, so you could do different things like play with contrast and bias to see if there's a bright pixel kind of towards the center, or you could try different color maps or different scales such as linear scales or logarithmic or power scales to see if maybe there's a core in the center. Um, the third activity introduces students to um, light curves, which just plots light intensity over time. White dwarfs and neutron stars can have um, hot spots on them in x-rays um, due to accretion of material from a companion star. So the material drops down onto a specific Point and causes a hot spot. Um, and it's kind of like a lighthouse, if you can picture a lighthouse beam um, moving around. If that hot spot is offset off the um, spin axis, as that um, stellar core spins on its axis, that hot spot would go in and out of our sight. And if you did a light curve, you would see that at times um, that it looked brighter and that at times it looked dimmer as it rotates in and out of your sight. So if you can find the period of the light curve, that would also give you the um, period of the spin rotation. Um, so we're looking at two objects, and um, one of the things that Donna said was students sometimes don't realize that everything that we know about these deep sky objects, we are getting from analyzing the light that comes to us from them. And if you look at this picture up here of the object Sun X3, I mean, you just kind of see a round, kind of cool looking set of pixels, but how in the world do astrophysicists know if it's a white dwarf or a neutron star or anything else for that matter? Um, and this activity helps show how they might be able to make some determinations about what the object is. Um, so up at the top right, there is a light curve that I have zoomed in on to try to help see the period. And if you look at each of those peaks and you look at the y-axis, I mean the x-axis, sorry, which is time, you'll see that those peaks are about five seconds apart. Um, to get a little bit more precision, you can run a power spectrum in, G in JS9, which is a Fourier transform, and it looks for um, any periodicity that might be in the data. And you see a big peak at uh, point 208 hertz. So if you do one divided by 0.208 hertz, it gives you a period of about 4.81 seconds, which is 
a little bit more precise than the five seconds you get from the other light curve. Looking at GK per, I mean, if you look at, this is like a perfect um, example. This GK per really looks a lot like Cenex 3 did in the slide before, um, but they definitely have different spin rates if you look at the light curves. Um, the light curve of GK per, if you just look at the top one, and there's definitely a lot of noise in there, um, but you can see it's about 300 seconds if you kind of look at the overall trend. And then when you do a power spectrum, you get a peak at 0 0.0028 hertz or 0 0.0029 hertz, somewhere around there. I mean, you can also see some in the power spectrum that there's some other mechanism that's going on there. There's some little bumps on either side of that bigger peak. So there's some other things that might be kind of periodic going on there, but I'm not quite as strong. Um, so there is a third kind of analysis that, you, analysis that you can do to zoom in on what the actual period might be. Um, this one maybe is a harder one for students to understand. It's called a period fold. Um, the way to picture what a period fold is doing is if you think that you know what the period was and you took the sine wave and you chopped it up into sections, each one of them being one period long, and then stacked all those sine waves on top of each other and added them together. If your choice for period wasn't quite right, then when you try to add those together, you're going to get destructive interference um, and parts of the waves are going to cancel each other out. But if you've picked the period close to right when you stack them on top of each other, you'll get constructive interference and you'll have your resulting um, period fold will have like a bigger amplitude and it will look more sign-like. So if you look at the graphs along the bottom, um, you see the first two tries have a much less a much smaller amplitude than the last try, which was at 351 seconds. So we had one thing that we just analyzed had a period of five seconds and one that had a period of 351 seconds. So one is obviously spinning quite a bit faster than the other one. Um, so now to determine whether or not they're a neutron star or a white dwarf or whether those are actually possibilities, um, the first thing would be for students to find the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of a white dwarf and a neutron star. So we would use um, a typical mass and a typical radius for a white dwarf and a neutron star. So a white dwarf has a mass of about um, the same as the sun and a radius of 5,800 kilometers and it's shown in the image next to planet Earth kind of as comparison. And then the neutron star has a mass about one and a half times the sun, but is only 10 kilometers in diameter, so a lot smaller, and it's shown in the picture here next to Manhattan, which is kind of cool. Um, so then you can use Newton's universal law of gravitation to determine what the acceleration due to gravity would be on the surface of a white dwarf and on the surface of a neutron star. Um, then we're gonna look at the centripetal acceleration on the surface of these stars at the equator um, so you're using the spin periods that you found in the light curves and then the radius for a white dwarf and for a neutron star and calculating the centripetal acceleration. And so you're going to, you don't know if Sun X3 and JK per, if they could be a white dwarf or a neutron star. So you're going to calculate um, what the acceleration, the centripetal acceleration would be in both cases using um, both of those radii. Um, if the centripetal acceleration is less than the acceleration due to gravity, then the force of gravity would be enough to hold that star together so that the you know, matter doesn't fly off or whatever. Um, if, it's, you know, if the thing is spinning too fast and your centripetal acceleration is greater than the available acceleration due to gravity, then that probably rules that out as being a white dwarf or a neutron star. So if your calculations do show, however, that it's possible that a star is a white dwarf, further analysis would really be necessary, such as looking at uh, luminosity and temperature. Okay, and the last one, 
is looking at star formation in the Cartwheel Galaxy and looking at ultra and hyperluminous X-ray sources to determine what the sources of these um, ultra and hyperluminous X-rays might be. Um, in the image that you see, the big image is a composite image from a bunch of different um, missions in different wavelengths. And in the top left corner, you see the um, X-ray image from Chandra showing the different X-ray sources. The Cartwheel Galaxy has a really interesting shape and an interesting name, kind of, too. Um, and the unusual shape is thought to be due to one of the smaller galaxies that you see in the bottom left corner of this image colliding with the Cartwheel Galaxy. And when it plunged through the Cartwheel Galaxy, um, triggered compression waves, which then um, started new star formation. So in JS9, you would first bring in the X-ray image, which is on the left-hand side of this screen here. Uh, I kind of played around with contrast and bias so that you'd be able to see the X-ray point sources that we are interested in. So they're little white dots on that black background. Um, and then JS9 allows you to, right from JS9, um, to bring in the optical image right next to it and you can synchronize the X-ray and the optical image so they're to the same scale and approximately in the same spot. And then the coolest thing is um, locking crosshairs so that as you move your mouse over the crosshairs in the X-ray one, the crosshairs move over the same portions in the optical one. So you can kind of see you know, where in the optical image are those X-ray sources corresponding to. Okay, so to figure out what those X-ray sources actually are, um, students determine the approximate time that the smaller galaxy collided with the Cartwheel Galaxy. Um, first of all, you need to know the size of the Cartwheel Galaxy, which is more easily found from the optical image than it is the X-ray image. So we've drawn a region around it again, um, which is on the screen in green, and you've seen those regions before on past slides. Um, in the gray box, the last number is the radius of the region in arc seconds, which you can then convert to radians, use the small angle formula, and the distance to the Cartwheel Galaxy, which is um, 380 million light years, and then you can figure out the size of the Cartwheel Galaxy in light years. Um, so if you know the size of the galaxy in light years, and through other means, they've determined that the expansion rate is about 200,000 miles per hour. So if you have its size and the expansion rate, um, you can use those two things to approximate when the smaller galaxy might have collided with the cartwheel, um, which comes out to about 300 million years ago. Um, so again, um, putting the optical image and the x-ray image. The optical image is on the top, the x-ray image is on the bottom. Um, the optical, um, the x-ray image on the bottom up in the top, in the top right hand corner, um, you can see that those point sources are kind of along the edge or the ring of the Cartwheel Galaxy corresponding to the little blue knots in the Hubble picture which is the top picture. Um, down at the bottom in the left hand corner um, there are some more point sources that probably correspond to those two galaxies that are in the bottom left corner of the top Hubble image. Um, so using the age um, of the collision, how long ago it happened, 300 million years, um, those X-ray sources could be things like supernova remnants, they could be black holes, neutron stars, because the lifetime of a massive star is less than 300 million years ago, which is when the new star formation started to happen. Um, when I was putting these activities together, I had read the scientific papers ahead of time, so I guess I was cheating a little bit because I was kind of going backwards and seeing if I could find things that um, JS9 and DS9 could do, getting ideas from scientific papers. But the really cool thing for my students always was after they finish an activity like the Cartwheel Galaxy or the one where they're looking at type 1a and type 2 supernova remnants is 
to then like look at the scientific papers when they start to read the scientific papers and they're like I can't believe I just came to the exact same answer that you know that the astrophysicists came and you know they're actually using they're using the same data they're not using fake data they're using the same data that the astrophysicists use um, that's really exciting to them so this whole slide is just kind of a quote from a paper that was published in the astrophysical journal letters about the cartwheel galaxy and you can see kind of the same images that you see in JS9 there and how the optical on the top is corresponding to the x-rays on the bottom. Scientific papers might even be a good place for when I read one of those scientific papers, I maybe understand a third of it, but it get, there are good places to get ideas of maybe investigations or things that you might be interested in doing on your own. <clears throat> um, so the most exciting thing about JS9, so these four activities are important because each one of them had a specific question that students were trying to answer. So they get an idea of what a question might look like that they want to investigate. And then each one of the activities also includes, gives them experience with using some of the different analysis tools like light curves and energy spectra and stuff like that. And then they can go to the guide that Terry Matilski is writing, the user guide for JS9. And you know, there's more tools that we haven't talked about, more possibilities. Um, there are so many FITS files, thousands and thousands and thousands of FITS files from all different missions, all different bands of the electromagnetic spectrum out there that are available to the public that students can bring into JS9 and do their own investigations on. Um, one place <laughs> is going to the Chandra photo album. So the URL is at the bottom left-hand side of this slide. Um, the photo album is organized um, the press releases are organized by date and they're also organized by type of object so there's a section on supernova or a section on galaxies um, when you go to those press releases there's usually a fast facts section down at the bottom and outlined in red is the observation id for the cartwheel galaxy um, this particular one was 2019 if you know the observation id then you can go to the unofficial Chandra archive search, and the URL is at the bottom right, type in that observation ID number, and then you can click on a link and retrieve the FITS file um, that can be then uploaded into JS9. JS9 even lets you um, just type in the URL of where the FITS file is and do everything online without downloading anything to your computer. Um, and then there are also FITS files from other missions, there's plenty of other archives out there, so if they wanted to look at something that wasn't in the X-ray spectrum and look at some other stuff, and that URL is at the top of the page there, um, so there's quite a list underneath. But, you know, when, you, when students most of the time during the day, I mean, they can do some stuff outside at night, but um, actually being able to collect real data that they can use is difficult sometimes in astronomy, so this just opens up um, a lot of possibilities for students. The webinar will be posted on the Chandra website and the PowerPoint slides that go along with this along with the transcript will be on the NSO website and we are still looking for a place to post the four JS9 activities that I introduced so you can keep checking back um, and looking for the URL for those.